Welcome back to Cartels, Conspiracies, and Camarena. I'm Jack Llewellyn. As always, thank you for joining me. Running a day or two late this week, but that's okay. I'm very excited about what we're going to talk about today. Before we get into the Camarena topic of the day, uh, I think our weekly obligatory updates on the El Mayo situation. Two things of interest. One is the Mexican government announced that they were opening an investigation into possible treason charges against Joaquin Guzman and perhaps others. Treason, you say. This all stems from the Dr. Umberto Alvarez Machine case. Remember, Dr. Alvarez was abducted in Guadalajara and flown to the United States, dumped off in El Paso, and turned over essentially to the DEA. Following that case, the Mexican legislature changed some of the laws, and the one in particular was the treason law, which basically says it's treason to forcibly abduct um, a Mexican citizen for the purposes of turning that person, that citizen, over to another government. So, Joaquin Guzman potentially facing treason charges in Mexico, of course, that's only ever going to apply if he was ever to uh, you know, get out of custody in the United States. Obviously, we're thinking he's going to look for a plea deal, turn on who knows how many people, and perhaps then get a lighter sentence. If he does, though, would he ever be able to get out and return to Mexico with these potential charges? So that's number one. Number two is remember last week we read the statement of El Mayo, the presumed statement of El Mayo. One of the people that he talked about was Hector Quinn, right? Hector was a former municipal pres president uh, for Culiacan. He had recently been elected to the Chamber of Deputies uh, with the pre party. El Mayo said that Hector was with him when he was abducted by Joaquin and, and people working with Joaquin, and that Hector was, in fact, killed. Then you'll remember, a couple of days later, the Sinaloa government and, and others released a video, a security video from a gas station that purported to show the murder of Hector Quinn. When you looked at the video itself, it was impossible to tell who it was. Uh, and then there were some discrepancies that didn't quite make sense. The national, or so the Mexican Attorney General's office has opened an investigation into some prosecutors and politicians in Sinaloa saying that they were covering up Mr. Quinn's murder and that the video of that assault in uh, at the gas station actually was not Mr. Quinn. Does that necessarily mean that everything in El Mayo's statement was true? Probably not, but uh, we have that issue out there. So that's the update on El Mayo. Now, today, we're going to talk about the alleged conspiracy meetings in the Camarena case. And remember where we're at in this process. The last couple of weeks interrupted by some discussions about Amaya, we talked about the actual abduction of Agent Camarena, looked at witness statements, and made some conclusions about the veracity and credibility of witnesses. Today, we're going to talk about the conspiracy meetings, and I want you to please think about these discussions in light of those prior discussions, because what we're going to do is put together three or four or five pieces to the puzzle 
and get a better picture of what's false, what could be true, what should be disregarded. So, specifically, when I talk about the conspiracy meetings, what am I referring to? Well, in the two Zuno trials, Zuno 1 and Zuno 2, there were a number of meetings discussed where the prosecution alleged and witnesses alleged that the kidnapping of Agent Camarena was discussed, whether in specifics or in general terms. And the the notion of these being meetings is something that the prosecution advanced. In many respects, I don't find them to be meetings as much as events where people might have been together. And sometimes think about this. If, if you're um, a bunch of doctors who get together at a party, what are you going to talk about quite often? Doctor stuff, right? Lawyers talk about legal stuff. Cops talk about police stuff. Drug dealers talk about drug dealing. So just inherently, I think the, the concept is, is interesting um, and somewhat dubious. But here's where it gets a little more interesting. Remember, if you will, that prior to Zuno 1, there was another trial. Remember, that was the trial involving Rene Verdugo and others. And interestingly enough, at that trial there were no conspiracy meetings discussed, none. And in fact, there was nothing talking about the Mexican government or government officials. None of that was in trial one. Somehow between trial one and Zuno one, though, Hector Cervantes Santos comes up. And he has a relationship, we've talked about this before, a relationship with Antonio Grate Bustamante, Suddenly, Hector Cervantes Santos appears on the DEA's doorstep and says, I can talk about conspiracy meetings and better, I can talk about conspiracy meetings involving high-profile Mexican officials. And he proceeds to do that, and he testifies to, uh, to some of those. Then, remember... Cervantes becomes totally discredited in between Zuno 1 and Zuno 2 while that new trial motion or, or an order was pending and on appeal. Cervantes is discredited. Uh, Cervantes recants. He unrecants. He's an absolute mess. So then in Zuno 2, you have Jorge Godoy and to a lesser extent, Rene Lopez Romero talking about these alleged meetings. And as we'll talk about in a few minutes, they're different. They're materially different. So when we talk about conspiracy meetings, what are we talking about? If you put together the testimony of Cervantes in Zuno 1, uh, Enrique Placencia Aguilar in Zuno 1, Godoy and Lopez Romero in Zuno 2, you end up with at least 10 conspiracy meetings. 10. So the government said, in essence, 10 meetings where kidnapping a DEA agent, getting rid of a DEA agent, handling a DEA agent, were all discussed, and these show a grand conspiracy, and that was part of how some of the defendants were convicted, including Ruben Zuno Arce. Now think for just a moment back to the discussions about the abduction itself. Is there anything about that that makes you think that there were 10 conspiracy meetings? I'm going to walk through these with you in particular. So of the 10 meetings, what do we have? We have a meeting in September of 1984 
uh, at a house called La Quinta where baptism occurred, and, and that's testified, testified to by Cervantes. Godoy says the first meeting to discuss this subject matter occurred at the Las Americas Hotel in September or more likely October 1984. Cervantes um, then testifies to two other meetings at La Quinta, one prior to and one after uh, a Barba wedding. These are in October of 1984. Godoy testifies to a meeting at the Marmar House in October of 1984. He also talks about another one at La Quinta in 1980, October 1984. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six alleged meetings in October of 1984. Okay. So at a minimum, you've got November, December, January, three months prior to the actual abduction of Agent Camarena. Then Placentia talks about a meeting in December of 1984 at La Bajadita. Godoy talks about one in December of 1984, but not at the same place. He says that there's one at Javier Barba Hernandez's office. In uh, Zuno 1, Cervantes testifies that there's another meeting at La Quinta in early February 1985. And, and remember, the abduction was February 8, 1985, so it has to be pretty darn early in, in February. Lopez Romero also testifies to a meeting in early 1985, but he says that the, it's at the Hidalgo Avenue house. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Espino Verdeen in particular talks about a meeting at Lope de Vega the morning of the abduction. So that's a whole lot of meetings. And that, in some respects, is a little bit dubious in and of itself. But it gets more peculiar. If you put together a list of all the people mentioned as having been at or participated in these 10 conspiracy meetings, and I'll leave off the, the morning of meeting at Lope de Vega. If you put those all together, you end up with a grand total of at least 72 people. 72. Now, remember, the allegation is these started in October, right? Maybe even September of 84, but let's say September. Um, October of 84. And you have 72 people who were at these meetings. Now, granted, not all of them are people who were, you know, involved in the discussions or maybe even heard the discussions or heard all of them. But isn't it a great conspiracy if you can have 10 meetings over the course of three or four months? involving more than 70 people and nobody says anything that gets picked up by anyone with a relationship with the DEA. You know, the DEA had informants and a good network of information, right? Nothing comes out. Nobody says anything. That's pretty questionable in and of itself, right? But it gets more incredible. Just as an example, let's talk about some of the people alleged to have been at one or more of the conspiracy meetings. Okay. You have Miguel Aldana Ibarra, former DFS and director of the Interpol office for Mexico. Okay. You have Enrique Alvarez del Castillo, the minister of defense at the time. You have Sergio Espino Verdeen, Commandant of the Federal Bureau of Political and Social Investigations. You have General Santoyo Feria, the Chief of Staff of the Secretariat of National Defense. You have Armando Pavon Reyes, 
premier commandante of the MFJP. You have Miguel Ibarra Herrera, who's the director of the MFJP. And you have Manuel Bartlett Diaz, the minister of the interior. Now, those are some pretty damn big names, right? Oh, and I forgot. You have General Gardoki. So you put those all together, and that's an amazing list. In addition to kind of the, the usual suspects, you know, Javier Barber Hernandez, uh, Rafael Caro Quintero, Ernesto Fonseca, Juan Ramon Mata Ballesteros, Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, uh, Cochi Loco, a, a whole variety. So think about this. Is this making sense to very many people? Ten meetings, four months, 70 some odd people, including some of the most famous, notable people in politics and government. And you've got your traffickers all meeting together and nobody hears anything. Right? Nothing comes up. And does in and of itself, does it make sense to you that somebody like General Gardoki, somebody like Manuel Bartlett Diaz, would be at a meeting with drug traffickers, at a large meeting with drug traffickers? Does that make a whole lot of sense? Well, before you answer that question, some research was done many years ago that I was ancillarily involved in. And it involved looking at one day in particular, February 7, 1985, Manuel Bartlett Diaz was accused in one or more of these witness statements of being at a meeting to discuss the kidnapping of Agent Camarena. What's interesting, of course, is that at the time, Manuel Bartlett Diaz, former governor, uh, you know, director of interior, was perhaps the most famous politician in Mexico who was not actually president. Right? His role was an incredibly public role. And as such, members of the press followed his activities on a regular basis. And that generally began at about 7 a.m. in the morning. And business was generally concluded not until later in the day, maybe as late as 10 or 11 p.m. It's interesting to note that no press reports highlight Either Governor Bartlett being um, out of Mexico City that day, nor do they mention him traveling anywhere that day, nor are there any press reports by anyone in Guadalajara saying that he was seen that day in Guadalajara. So that's number one. Number two, Manuel Bartlett Diaz worked in Mexico City, right? He had an office in Mexico City. He had important functions in Mexico City. He had meetings, etc. So let's talk about the logistics. Would it have been logistically possible for him to have sneaked away unnoticed to attend clandestine meetings in Guadalajara, even assuming for the sake of argument that he wanted to. If you were going to fly from, or from Mexico City to Guadalajara, which you would have to do, right? Nobody's going to drive it. Uh, that wouldn't make any sense. A round trip between those cities would take approximately four and a half hours. 
since the meetings, and we could walk through all of the meetings. We talked about some of them in an earlier episode, and I could go into excruciating detail, but I'll save you at least for right now. But since these meetings took place in the early evening or later in the day, uh, they lasted for a couple of hours. There would have been, you know, it, it, it is impossible for there not have to have been large, unaccounted for blocks of time in his schedule. Right. So let's talk about the February 7 meeting. So Lopez Romero says there was a meeting at Lope de Vega, and he says that the meeting occurred February 7, 1985, started at about 7 p.m. and lasted until about 11 p.m. And it's claimed that, you know, it's February 7, they're go- that's when they're discussing picking up Agent Camarena. Here's what's interesting, folks. So, let's say Manuel Bartlett Diaz, for some reason, wanted to be in Guadalajara at 7 p.m. for a meeting, right? So, that would have meant he would have had to have been left Mexico City 5 o'clock or so, right? Well, here's what we know about his schedule that day. All of this has been verified in by witness statements, press reports, etc. But we know this for a fact, and then I'll, uh, I'll give you some more information. At 11 a.m., Manuel Bartlett Diaz met with Fernando Gutierrez Ortega, Secretary of Finance for the state of Guan- Guanajuato. Okay. 11.30 a.m., he met with Congressman Anguano. At 12 p.m., he met with Alfonso Martinez Dominguez, governor of Nuevo León. At 1 p.m., he had a meeting with Pablo Emilio Madero, the leader of the PAN party. At 1.30, he had a meeting with Alejandro Cervantes Delgado the governor of the state of Guerrero. At 2 p.m., he had a meeting with the journalist Javier Lozada. At 5.30, he met with Alberto Isaac Ahomada, an official from the Department of Radio, Television, and and, and Cinema. Sorry. At 6 p.m., he met with Raul Castellano Jimenez, senator from Michoacan. And at 9, he had a meeting with Jose Maria Morfin Petraca, an official from the Secretariat of Government responsible for elections. In a letter dated December 30, 1992, Fernando Gutierrez Ortega confirmed that he did, in fact, meet with Governor then Secretary Bartlett at 11 a.m. on February 7. For purposes of tendering his resignation as Secretary of Finance for the state of Guanajuato, this account is further confirmed in a February 8, 1985 newspaper article. Okay. In a recent letter, Alfonso Martinez Dominguez also verified that while he was the governor of Nueva Lone, he met with Governor Bartlett on February 7 from 12 to 1 p.m. One of Governor Bartlett's aides signed a declaration where he said he vividly remembered the meeting because he, the the declarant, was a native of Nuevo León and was assigned to receive Governor Martinez and escort him to the meeting with Manuel Bartlett Diaz. The other meetings for that day were also verified. Jorge Morfin Petraca recalls the meeting between Pablo Emilio Madero, the leader of the PAN political party, and Governor Bartlett, beginning at 1 p.m. 
Additionally, Raul Castellano, who who, um, at one point, in addition to his other functions, was the general consul of Mexico in New Orleans, he confirmed that he attended a meeting between his father, Raul Castellano Jimenez, and Governor Bartlett at 6 p.m. on that same day. Hey. Remember, he's... Consul General of Mexico in New Orleans saying that he was at a meeting with his father and Manuel Bartlett Diaz at 6 p.m. on the day that Rene Lopez Romero says that at 7 o'clock, Manuel Bartlett Diaz was at a meeting in at Lope de Vega in Guadalajara. More importantly, more importantly, Mr. Morphin, who was... Governor Bartlett's aide responsible for implementing decisions of the Federal Election Commission in 1985 gave a sworn statement where he recalls having met with Governor Bartlett on the night of February 7 to discuss electoral matters. In his affidavit, he says that meeting began at 9 p.m. and lasted approximately one and a half to two hours. One and a half to two hours. Its purpose was to prepare Governor Bartlett for his meeting with President Miguel de la Madrid, which was to take place the following day. And that meeting is the the next day with the president is confirmed by several press reports. And I could go on and on and on. Hey. So let's backtrack for a second. What do we have? We have 10 alleged conspiracy meetings over three or four months. We have 70-something witnesses or, or participants, excuse me. We have several high profile, very high profile people allegedly at these meetings, including Manuel Bartlett Diaz. And we have Sworn statements, affidavits, letters that suggest that Manuel Bartlett Diaz could not possibly have been at least at at least one of these meetings. Now, keep in mind that when we talk about the meetings, in in many respects, the only meeting that can be nailed down to a precise date is the February 7th meeting because it's the day before the abduction. The rest tend to be described as sometime in October, sometime in December. Maybe you get a late December. Well, it's not you know, it's not surprising that even somebody as high profile as Manuel Dar- Bartlett Diaz or General Gardoki or others wouldn't necessarily know their exact schedule every day in a month. Um, and these Descriptions of the meetings tend to be very nonspecific about times, right? Again, the one notable exception being the February 7th meeting where Lopez Romero testified to specific times. Okay. Now, let's look at some some inconsistencies. Okay. First, I want to look at inconsistencies between what Cervantes said in Zuno 1 and what Godoy and to a lesser extent Lopez Romero say in Zuno 2 right and I'm going to give you what am I going to give you seven specific examples and trust me when I say I can give you chapter and verse i can give you page and line numbers in the transcripts for each one of these statements so what do we have number one at zuno's first trial cervantes said that mr zuno ruben zuno arce attended an initial meeting in september 1984 during a baptism at Barbara's residence located or known as La Quinta 
where they wanted to learn the identity of the DEA agent causing trouble. Remember, we've talked about that statement in the past. In Zuno 2, though, Godoy says, no, no, no. The first meeting occurred at the Las Americas Hotel in October and that the participants knew who the agent was because Aldana said he had tried to bribe him but that the agent refused to take the bribe. Godoy also testified that he accompanied Fonseca to all meetings outside of his home, and he never attended a meeting at La Quinta where a baptism occurred. Example number two, Cervantes Cervantes testified that at a post-wedding meeting in October 1984, there was discussion that they wanted to find out who the agent was to see if he would take a bribe. That, of course, is also completely inconsistent with what Godoy testified to with respect to the Las Americas meeting or alleged meeting. Number three, Cervantes testified about meetings in October 1984 while Donna was trying to find and and to identify the DE agent, quote, causing the problems. Again, Godoy says that in 19, in um, October of 84, Aldana already knew who the agent was because they tried to bribe him. Number four, Cervantes' testimony that the participants at the October meetings still had... Um, Oh, sorry, let me let me move on to number five. The, the, there's just another example of where Godoy said, we already know who he is because Aldana tried to bribe him. Cervantes testifies, says, hey, we're just trying to, to figure out who the agent is. We're trying to identify him. Placentia, in the first trial, testified about a December 1984 meeting at Fonseca's house called La Bajadita, and that the participants knew who Camarena was because a photograph of Camarena was passed around and Fonseca told everyone he would take care of Camarena. Okay. Godoy, on the other hand, said that Mr. Zuno and others were present at a December meeting, but that it occurred at Barbara's residence called the office, and the participants still did not know who the agent was. Right? So essentially, trial one, they've no, they know who it is, right? That's the government's case. Number one, man, they know who it is early on. December of 84, they're passing around a picture of, of Camarena. Godoy, of course, is inconsistent there, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Here's something interesting. Number six. Notably and conspicuously absent from any of the meetings testified to by Cervantes are some of the the big important people. Gardoki, Castillo, Bartlett Diaz, none of them are present in any of the meetings talked about by Cervantes in Zuno 1. If you chart it all out, Godoy and Lopez include at least 20 additional or different participants than those testified to by Cervantes. Interestingly enough, not one of the government witnesses at Zuno's second trial, so Zuno 2, not one of them placed Juan Ramon Matabayesteros at any of the conspiracy meetings, but in Zuno 1, he was a prominent figure in at least two of those meetings and was a central figure in the cartel. Right? Hey. So, Matabayesteros is in one, but not in two. Last, Godoy says in Zuno 2 
that Cervantes had worked at Barbara's residence, the office, where he attended a December 1984 meeting. Cervantes, however, said that he worked at La Quinta, also a residence of, of Barbara's, and that was located at 114 Tonalaw. He never, ever, 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 ever mentioned a residence owned by Barbara called the office or said that a meeting took place at some place named the office. So what do you have here? You've got complete and total inconsistencies between the testimony of Cervantes and and others, but mostly Cervantes in Zuno 1 and the testimony of Godoy in Zuno 2. But it gets worse. Let's talk about internally inconsistent statements at Zuno 2. Godoy says that the first meeting, the Las Americas Hotel, they knew who the the identity was, right? Godoy testified that at the second, third, and fourth meetings, they met solely to discuss their efforts to identify the DE agent causing the cartel trouble. Can't be both ways, right? Um, Lopez Romero actually testified that Fonseca knew who the agent was because they knew the agent was going to be moved. Remember, Agent Camarena was going to be transferred to San Diego, right? He was leaving Guadalajara. The dates are a little bit uncertain as to exactly when it was going to be, but it was pretty soon, you know, sometime in in mid-February. So you've got Godoy saying second, third, and fourth meetings, they're trying to identify the person. In the first meeting, he said they knew who it was because Aldana had tried to bribe him. And Lopez says, no, 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 we know who it is because we know he's going to be moved. Another inconsistency for Godoy. Godoy testified that there was a conspiracy meeting or more one or more conspiracy meetings in November and December of 1984. Okay. And he testified to some of the people there, including Ruben Zuno Arce. But, but he says, Godoy said, that he only observed conspiracy meetings while he was in Fonseca's employ. And he says, and he says that he didn't work for Fonseca in November, 1984 and December, 1984. When it became clear that of this discrepancy, right, that he didn't work for Fonseca in November and December 1984, Godoy, inconsistent with all of his statements in his DA6 briefings, for the very first time tries to push the meeting dates back to September and October 1984. So, Godoy also testifies that at the first, second, and third conspiracy meetings, Carl and Fonseca were relying on the efforts of Aldana in particular to identify an, the unknown DE agent, right? And they were getting frustrated by um, their unsuccessful efforts. And uh, Enrique Alvarez del Castillo, the Minister of Defense, was also involved in that. But, but then Godoy says, in the final meeting, Castillo was yelling at Carl because he had not gathered the necessary information. Internally inconsistent. 
Godoy also claimed that Javier Barba owned a residence called The Office, as we talked about, where the December 1984 meeting occurred. Godoy, however, has that testimony directly impeached by a defense witness by the name of Salvador Degado Lopez, the estate lawyer for the Barba family, who testified he personally knew the owners of the property, called The Office, and Barba did not own and had never been at the office. And again, there's transcript sites right here that I can show you. So let's think about this for a second. I want to go, I keep going back. Put on your, your you know, whatever hat you want to wear to judge credibility. To judge veracity. To just think, does anything make common sense? Ten meetings over four months. Seventy-two or more participants, including high-profile generals, government officials. The director of the MFJP, others from the MFJP, uh, and of course Manuel Bartlett Diaz. Those conspiracy meetings never discussed at the first Camarena trial. Then you have Cervantes testifying to one set of facts. Godoy testifying to a completely different set of facts. Note, of course, that Cervantes is never called as a witness at trial too. And then you have internal inconsistencies between Godoy's statements in and of themselves and Godoy and Lopez Romero. So what can we conclude from that? Well, one could say that the meetings themselves just don't make sense, right? And this idea that they're sitting around talking, you know, for hours and hours about this, you know, the idea that they may have been, that there were discussions amongst some of the traffickers about why their drugs were being found, totally understand. But this long list of long meetings with lots of people just doesn't make logical sense. It doesn't make sense that somebody like General Gardoki or Manuel Bartlett Diaz would have attended these meetings. Just that just on its face doesn't make sense. And remember, let's assume that all of the witnesses about where Manuel Bartlett Diaz was on February 7th are lying. And somehow he was in Guadalajara at a meeting at Lope de Vega from 7 to 11 p.m. Wouldn't you expect that if he was there, he would have checked into a hotel somewhere? He would have, you know, the likelihood of being noticed. I mean, what was he going to do? Sleep on a hide bed at Lope de Vega? Of course not. And yet we know, because we have press reports, we know that he was in meetings the very next morning. So how does that make any sense, including one with President de la Madrid? And you can't fake that, folks, right? When the press is reporting on a meeting between the director of interior and the president of Mexico, that happened. That happened the next day. What else can we say for certain? Well, we know Cervantes was unreliable, right? He was so unreliable, he wasn't even called at the second trial. But let me ask you a question. If he was unreliable after he testified, 
Why wasn't he determined to be unreliable before he testified? Much of the initial effort to discredit Cervantes was done by defense attorneys. And frankly, it wasn't that difficult. If as a government, as if as a prosecutor, you're going to put somebody on to testify in a trial involving several defendants, and you're going to testify about conspiracy meetings. And remember, conspiracy is the great way to bring everybody in. Then shouldn't there be some requirement to verify the testimony that's going to be made? And whatever efforts at verification there were certainly weren't very good, right? Because he was discredited afterwards. So what about Godoy? Godoy, who had all kinds of issues in Mexico, who's happy as hell to get away from Mexico, comes up and testifies in ways that are internally inconsistent, inconsistent with Lopez Romero, his buddy, and inconsistent with what was said by Cervantes. We'll talk about the timing of Godoy and Lopez next week. We've talked about it a little bit before, but we're going to go into detail. But Godoy himself is an unreliable witness. His own testimony makes him an unreliable witness. These discrepancies aren't minor discrepancies. They're significant. If Godoy is to be believed, then you have to discount his own testimony. Right. If you want to say he's a credible witness, then you have to discount portions of his testimony. And he simply cannot do that. So the prosecution, aided by certain members of the DEA, and Zuno 1 put on Cervantes an unreliable witness. In Zuno 2, they put on Jorge Godoy, an unreliable witness who contradicts himself. And and just for the sake of argument, just because Cervantes was unreliable doesn't mean he was always wrong. Not necessarily, you know, about everything. But you've got inconsistent stories, and that's what the government put up. Two entirely inconsistent stories. That, my friends, should give you pause. It should make you question the legitimacy of the prosecutions and the truthfulness, the veracity, the ethical nature of those prosecutions. Okay. Kind of went further than I wanted to there, but we're going to come back to all of that uh, in a little bit or in, in, in some additional episodes. So coming up, we're going to talk about a couple of other things. We're going to talk about Godoy and Lopez as people and their coming to the United States, their initial testimony or statements to the DEA. We're then going to talk about things relating to Lope de Vega and some other things. And as I say, then we're going to put it all together into uh, a puzzle where we're putting the pieces together. So that is Cartels, Conspiracies, and Camarena for this week. Remember my newsletter? There's a lot of cool stuff in there. There's some great articles coming out. Insight um, Crime has a really nice article this week about the El Mayo situation. All you got to do is click the links. I put it right there for everybody. Um, So do look out for that. Um, 
I've got a release date for my second book. We'll talk about that next week. Um, but for now, I'll let you go, and I'll see you next week on Cartels, Conspiracies, and Camarena. Thanks, everybody. Have a good week.